okay so uh, good evening and welcome everybody uh, to uh, the second session of uh, lectures on lqg well lqg lectures 2020 december 9th so um i know it's kind of funny to see that i'm wearing a mask uh, but uh, uh there were some workers just fixing things in my room a bit ago a little while ago so i'm going to wear a mask until the um you know the air has circulated for long enough i guess okay so let's continue with what uh, we were talking about yesterday we are i started talking about the atm formalism okay but uh, before doing the atm formalism let me just remind you why we are doing the atm formalism so we have the um, action for general relativity uh, and also uh, just to remind those who are new today that uh, you can interrupt me at any point in time you can unmute yourself and ask a question is that um, so we have this action for general relativity where r is the ricci scalar and the thing is we want to construct a quantum theory right um so one of the paths is canonical quantization so canonical quantization the way it proceeds is uh you have a system which is which has a hamiltonian let's say right then you have the phase space of that hamiltonian and then it might turn out to be the case that your system has some constraints so if your system has constraints then you have to follow this direct procedure to uh, implement the constraints on your phase space and when you implement those constraints then you get uh your so this this is your kinematic phase space if you have constraints then you implement them then you get your physical phase space right so one example of this is for instance when you study the quantization of the electromagnetic field um what uh, the canonical quantization what happens is that you get um states uh so uh, with have negative norm and so then you have to uh uh project out those states and then that i think is called the gupta bleuler uh quantization so we have we will see that what happens is that first we have to obtain a hamiltonian for general relativity now the way you obtain a hamiltonian is that you have some action and your action is uh some integral of some lagrangian right now the problem is that uh this lagrangian so we at present the lagrangian that we have up here right so the lagrangian is something that that is defined on a on a three dimensional manifold we don't have that yet because this ricci scalar doesn't make any reference to any three dimensional manifold it's off and uh, all right this much better okay so but once you can once you can do that then let's say you can write this in this form um in such a way that you have let's say some factor here uh, which we will see which comes from the matrix and then you have some function uh so this is r and you have some function which is defined purely on your uh, spatial manifold so then in this case so this is your lagrangian 
Now, the way you obtain a Hamiltonian, right, from a Lagrangian is by means of what is called a Lajanda transform. So, for instance, if your if your Lagrangian is has some parameters q and q dot, right? Uh, then from this you define the momentum variable. So the momentum variable becomes uh, so, functional derivatives. The derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the generalized velocity and let's call this uh, well p and then you define the hamiltonian as as this guy so this right like this so i'm writing these as curly letters to denote the fact that these are just respectively the lagrangian and hamiltonian densities uh, which are defined at each point in space so the total hamiltonian and lagrangian would be the integral of the functions over your spatial manifolds. So we have to, uh, so when we do this procedure for, uh, for general relativity, what we find is that the Hamiltonian turns out to be a sum of three different terms. Okay. And let me just call it H1, H2, and H3 for now. And each one of these terms um, is a constraint. Uh, so the total sum of the whole, uh, so the Hamiltonian is actually zero on the phase space of uh, general relativity. And this is something that is unique to theories which have diffeomorphism invariant. So uh, one, one reason for this is that if you have a diffeomorphism invariant theory, uh, then the only way that you can define uh, physical observables is by uh, looking at what happens on the boundary of your of your space time. Uh, so uh, you know it's only the you know so in the bulk the Hamiltonian is zero. Now uh, so what we want to do is we want to proceed. Uh, we want to get this Lagrangian density from the Ricci scalar. Okay. So first we construct our foliation. So what is our foliation? We have some four dimensional manifold and uh, we assume, okay, so this is an assumption that uh, M is diffeomorphized, right? So there's some diffeomorphism, which I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, did somebody say something? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I'm Demala. Yeah. Uh, uh, some audio problem. I couldn't hear oh, uh, the sorry, comments yeah. on the diffeomorphism invariant theory. Uh, ah, okay, repeat? okay. From that point on, sure, sure, sure. No, what I said was that in a diffeomorphism invariant theory, the Hamiltonian is always zero. So the reason is that you, you know, you if you want to make make any physical measurements, you have to do so by uh, you by looking at the bar, what happens on the boundary of your, of your bulk space time. So in the bulk, your Hamiltonian oh. is, is zero. So there, there's a general argument for that. Okay. So is there any general proof of that? Uh, that I, 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 I believe so. I believe so. Okay. Uh, yeah. So now assume we assume that this uh, this M has a topology of uh, uh, R3, uh, uh, well, it's R4, uh, topologically it's R4, okay? And so uh, we can foliate it as in this way, we can foliate it um, as some collection of uh, three manifolds, sigma, which are labeled by 
No, so Nehal is asking a question, why are we working with three-dimensional Lagrangian density? Because in quantum mechanics, you evolve with time, you keep space and time separate, but here we have a generally covariant theory. Right, so Nehal, the whole point is that we, the, of the ADM uh, pro, uh, formulation and of the canonical quantization program is that you first you construct a Hamiltonian. Now, when you construct a Hamiltonian, uh, or a Lagrangian, then uh, you are by definition uh, making a choice of a for, of of a foliation or a, you know separation into time and space. Uh, you're you're making a choice of observers with respect to whom you define your spatial manifold. Uh, so the whole point is ultimately to go to a quantum theory, right? And uh, when you get to the quantum theory, then the hope is that one can recover recover classical mechanics or classical general relativity from that quantum theory uh, which does not have this foliation uh, dependence okay but the question that you are asking is is completely you know it's, it's something that we have to always keep in mind and uh, right but but yeah the whole point is that you know we are breaking that general covariance in this procedure because we want a Hamiltonian and then we want to quantize that Hamiltonian. So we have this manifold and it is uh, diffeomorphic to uh, you know, some slices times some uh, one parameter, which is let's say the time function. And um, so then what we do, so we have some, you know, let's say, Deepakta, may I uh, say one thing again? Yeah, yeah, of course. Huh. So the thing is, it is very interesting to me, and that's why I'm asking again, mm -hmm. that uh, the, in the bulk, uh, in uh, diffeomorphism invariant theory, mm -hmm. uh, according to your point, the uh, is zero. Right, the Hamiltonian right. is a constraint, yes. Uh, so the degrees of freedom uh, lie in the boundary, you are saying? Right. Or, okay. Okay. So the uh, so how the role uh, of the boundary come into the picture or or the degree we'll, of freedom? We'll we'll I'll 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 we'll talk about that at some point. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Let, let let us let us save this. Uh, let us save this discussion for for a different time. Um, but but we will we will uh, go over this point, okay? So we have these uh, spatial slices, right? And they are labeled by some by some time function. So then what we have is uh, we have some a vector field. Um, let's say so. Let me let me draw the. Spatial slice again. So your spatial slice. On this spatial slice, so you have some vector field here. Let's say T mu. And so the first thing that we do is that is we take this this uh, vector field, this uh, which we call the time evolution vector field, right? And we decompose it into two parts. We one part which is normal to the hypersurface, and one part which is tangential to the hypersurface. So, right, you can do this for any vector in any uh, for in any local uh, tangent space, right? So T mu becomes a sum of a part which is a hypersurface orthogonal, and a part which is. So this is the. hypersurface orthogonal part and this is the tangential part okay and then now what what is the uh, interpret what are this what is this n this n is a function 
right? It's a function from uh, this it's a function, and it's called the lapse. And what this function does is it measures the local uh, the speed of uh, clocks according to local observers. So, and n mu is a vector field, but it's a it's a spatial vector field. Now I have written it as n mu, right? And if you remember the notation from yesterday, uh, these indices like mu, nu, etc., they are space-time indices. They go from zero to three. Uh, then we'll be using lowercase letters like a, b, c. These will be spatial indices. Uh, then later on, we'll be encountering uh, some Lorentz Lie algebra indices, which will uh, again take values from zero to four. And finally, we'll have some SU2 indices, which will again take values in one, two, three. So now this, this N mu, this is called the shift vector. And you can think of it as specifying the uh, local velocities of observers in the uh, in you know along the hypersurface. Now, um, okay. So once we have this this normal vector, and the normal vector satisfies right, it's a it's a time-like unit vector. So it satisfies this requirement. Its norm is uh, negative one, right? And we are working again, in case you didn't, um, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> this is the de default uh, signature for any, uh, any reasonable person these days. So, and, uh, all right. So now what we can do is we can write down the metric, the full uh, four dimensional metric can be expressed uh, in terms of uh, this lapse and shift. So we will, we will see that, uh, but first let me define something else, uh, which is this quantity H mu nu, okay? So this quantity, is a projector onto the hypersurface. And the way this works is uh, you can check that if you take any vector field, and you take the, you contract it with this uh, tensor H, what do you get? You get, uh, you get V mu plus N mu uh, times N nu dot V nu, okay? Now the thing is uh, that if this vector field V mu happens to be N mu, then, then what does the right side of this equation give you? It gives you n mu plus n mu times n nu n nu. But this quantity is minus one, so you get zero, right? So that shows you uh, that uh, this tensor is purely spatial, okay? And this was a point which I tried to uh, stress in um, in the first lecture, is that um, so even though we are writing it with four indices, right? What we will do later is we will write it with three indices, right? Once we switch over to coordinates which are adapted to the spatial hypersurface, then we can write it as a three by three matrix. Okay, now what is the what does this uh, what does this object do? 
So with, with this object, with h mu nu, we can raise the index of h mu nu. One, we raise one index. So what do we get? We get delta mu nu plus n mu n nu. Okay. So sorry, this is not the projector. The projector is what I've just defined. This is the three metric. This is the projector. On sigma. So now let's say that you are given some arbitrary tensor. Okay. And now we define uh, T, uh, let's say, how do we, how do we write it? Uh, is equal to h mu alpha h nu beta t alpha beta okay now the reason i put this uh, this parallel sign here is because this tensor is purely spatial right and the reason for that is as i explained to you that this object h mu nu it annihilates anything anything which has a uh, component proportional to the normal vector okay so uh, you know you can you can take you can always construct a local basis for your tangent space right and you can always write uh, any any tensor you can decompose it into a sum of uh, uh, tensors which are built out of that of the components, uh, component vectors uh, of that tangent space. And if you apply the projector to each such uh, uh, component, the normal parts will always uh, vanish, the parts which are normal to the hypersurface. Um, okay, and then you can also easily check that if you uh, do this, if you contract this with itself, you get H mu. So it's a so this means it's a projector. Okay. Now, uh, similar to this, so this is our spatial projector. Okay. In a similar manner, we can define the normal projector. So the normal projector will take any tensor. And it will give you the component, the part of that tensor, which is, you know, which is purely normal, right? And also note that when you are doing this, this projection, you have to take, you have to apply one projector for each index, right? So I'm taking H nu beta for this one index beta and H mu alpha for this index alpha, right? So I have to take each index and project that out individually. Uh, and uh, you know you you can you can see that you can see this clearly for a single vector field, right? So if you if you take a single vector field, so let let me just uh, clarify this a little bit. If you take a, any any individual vector field, you can always write it as uh, this thing: v parallel mu plus v perpendicular mu, where v parallel is you know, tangent, it lies in the tangent space of uh, the, the hypersurface, and this is the normal component. So if you take uh, this tensor H mu nu and contract it with this vector field, V mu, v mu let's say, what will happen is uh, that, so you have G mu nu plus N mu N nu contracted with V mu, this plus V perpendicular and, uh, okay. Of course, it doesn't matter whether I, in this index, whether I use mu or nu because this tensor is symmetric, but you know, just a matter of habit. 
and what you will have is that this perpendicular component will always be, right so it's by definition is proportional to the normal vector and so as i just showed uh, that uh, when you take the normal vector and act on uh it with this tensor you get zero right uh, one second uh well because uh, so nehal is asking a question is there a is there a unique normal to the hypersurface and uh, yeah that's uh, not a such a bad question actually uh because Uh, well the reason there is a unique normal right and the reason there is a unique normal is first of all because your spatial surface is three dimensional and it is embedded in a four dimensional space time right so it's a co dimension one surface so if you have a co dimension one surface then there can only be one direction which is perpendicular to that to that surface okay so for instance if i take a line if i take a line in three dimensional space if i have three dimensional space and i take a line then how many directions are there going to be which are perpendicular to it i can take i can draw two such directions right so and if i have a plane then i have only one direction so i i hope that satisfies you your uh... now of course the thing is that all of such questions can be gone into in much greater rigor and detail there is really no no end to it okay so but i i don't find uh, so there there is this saying that uh, too much rigor leads to mental is a good motive so at least uh, if you are a physicist but there there is also another another very beautiful uh, quote about am i stuck again can you hear me hello uh, can you hear me i can hear you okay was there we any can, we can hear you okay great no great great okay so and there's also another very beautiful quote about rigor which says that uh, uh rigor rigor cleans the window through which intuition shines so that means that uh, you know if you, if you if you really don't don't have enough rigor well then uh, you know uh, you will never clear away the the dust of doubt but if you have too much rigor then that is like uh, somebody who is obsessive compulsively cleaning the window all the time okay right okay so where was that right so now we can always do this for a single vector right but let's say what what if we have a vector uh, if you have a tensor field with two indices right then then what well so any such tensor field again can be can be written as uh, can be decomposed into a so uh, okay let me just uh, go a little bit more slowly any any vector field can be composed into a normal part and a and a tangential part uh, and also the thing is that there will also be Okay, one second. Uh, I'm I'm needed. Okay, I'll be right back. Please pardon the interruption. So I was saying that if you have a tensor field, right, it will have uh, components which are parallel, which are perpendicular, but it will also have components which are a mixture. Uh, and and the reason for this is that if you imagine that, for instance, your local tangent space has some um, has some basis. Okay, E mu. and uh, then uh, you, from this 
from this basis, you can construct uh, uh, these combinations e mu e mu, right? So any any tensor, uh, I will write it as some bold object. Any tensor can be written as a sum of uh, these vectors. And okay, I guess I should. Let me give my, my vector field an internal index and this is the component index. This is where like e i j e i j e i j e i i Nehal, did you have a question? You had unmuted yourself. So now, um, what is this EIJ? Well, what I'm doing is that I have some local tangent space, right? And I'm choosing a set of basis vectors. E1, E2, E3, right? That's what these basis vectors are. So this I represents uh, the internal, uh, the these are the indices in the local tangent space, right? So these are, you can, there's a Lorentz indices. So uh, you can take, you can take any tensor, any arbitrary tensor, and which, you know, has however many indices you want it to have. And so this is mu nu. Sir, why are we using Lorentz indices in particular? Well, because the tangent space in your four-dimensional space-time will be a Lorentzian, uh, will be a Lorentz space, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you can you will have you know I J K T. Right, I'm, I'm just doing this to illustrate to you uh, that uh, for any arbitrary tensor with any number of space-time indices, you can always write this tensor um, uh, using this uh, procedure, right? And then when you contract this uh, with n mu, what will happen is all of those E's, all of those tensor uh, vectors, which are normal to new N new will, will uh, drop out. Okay, and then you'll be left with a purely uh, spatial component. So that's what this, this H does. That's why you need multiple uh, copies of H in this. I, I hope that this point is clear as to why you need multiple copies of H. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, like mu nu, that also is like it has four indices and also like how is that different from ij indices? So, so mu nu are 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 space time indices. Right? Yes. Okay. So when I say that um, I have some point in my space time. Uh, so how do I how do I define coordinates on my on my uh, manifold, right? Coordinates are given by a set of functions. So for instance, I have four functions x mu, and each okay, and each each of these x mu is a function from my manifold to the real line, right? All right, this is my set of coordinates on my manifold. Yes, sir. Right. But now I can define a, uh, what do you call it? At each point, I have some tangent space. So this is not a, uh, 
or something a little bit more. At each point, I have some tangent space. Okay. Now in this tangent space, I can always choose some basis of vectors of this tangent space. Okay. And these basis vectors, I will have to give them some label, right? So I label them i, j, k, let's say. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. And the thing is, see, uh, there is a local symmetry in the tangent space, right? So in this case, for instance, there will be a local Lorentz symmetry. In, when you're yes. in three dimensions, there is a local rotational symmetry. Okay. Uh, if you want to think yes. about it in a, in a, in a three-dimensional example, it's like saying that at each point, I have a different choice of of local frame. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Now, in, in three dimensions, in, in flat space, what happens is, uh, you know, you don't need to, you, you don't, you, there is no difference between the frames from one point to another point to another point. So you have this notion of parallel transport when you take a frame from one point to another point to another point, right? It remains the same. But when you are in a geometry with curvature, when you parallel transport a frame, it develops a, a, a rotation. And that rotation is precisely encoded in something called a connection. And that's why this object is called a connection. So the we will see what this is later on. This, this tells you how the local frames at each point is related to the local frames around it. Okay, so where was I? Deepak, I had a question. Uh, yeah, Mustafa, tell me. Could you go back to the previous page, please? Yep, yeah, so here is the tensor pi spatial. Which tensor? Uh, the, the tensor that you have written oh, in the last pi, line. Pi, sorry, uh, I was trying to draw a, a bold T, but you're right, it looks like a pi. No, it's just an arbitrary tensor, right? I was just showing that you can take an any arbitrary tensor. And, uh, you know, uh, so if you have a, so if you have a local frame, right? From a local frame, you can construct, uh, you can construct, a, outer products, right, of the vectors. So, so you get a bi vector, you get a tri vector, you get as many, uh, you know, it's a space of differential forms, right? You, you get N possibilities. Yep. And not, uh, they don't have to be, sorry, they don't have to be differential forms. They don't have to be symmetrized or anti-symmetrized. So you can take any tensor, right? So if you have a rank K tensor, right? That rank yes. K tensor can be written as a sum of those components, right? Over those K, K vectors. Okay. Right? You see? Yep. So for, again, let, this is why I'm, I want everybody to be, uh, so you, for instance, let's say I have three vectors. This is, these are my three basis vectors. Out of my three basis vectors, how many uh, bi vectors can I construct? I can construct, uh, well, uh, three bi vectors, right? And then I can take any tensor with any two by two tensor, right? And I can write it as uh, this. T i j e i e j like this, right? And if you have if you have a higher rank tensor, like a you know, three rank, four rank, whatever, it depends on your space time dimensionality, right? And now you imagine that one of these uh, directions, one of these vectors, is your normal. And the other ones are your spatial direction. 
right? Because you know we are making that split at each point, right? And so then when I apply that H H projector to to each index of this tensor T. right what will happen wherever that tensor encounters this e1 component those terms will be annihilated right and then i'll be left with um so for instance in this case i'll be left since i'm saying my e1 is my normal and e2 and e3 are my you know so to speak the tangential vectors then all my vectors will end up having components which are only you know have this e2 e3 so if you have a four dimensional space you can again take the tri vectors you can take other combinations okay so i i hope that this point is clear this is one of the things which uh, initially when you first learn about it it's like you know some really smart people they understand it right away but if you're if you're like me then you might take a little bit of time to understand that so now the next thing is uh that uh so we have this this uh this projector h mu nu and like i said now i can write it using my spatial indices purely spatial indices okay so a b let's say and this defines a metric on my three dimensional space oh, so again uh, nehal is uh, asking does this mean you can choose a normal nei such that h ab is equal to eta ab okay i i i am not following the question there are a lot of indices uh, can you like unmute yourself and ask a question nehal uh so i mean is it possible that uh, you could uh, on a uh, hypersurface you could uh, have a hypersurface metric to be uh, to be the minkowski metric uh, yeah of course given some coordinate system absolutely i mean you can always uh, right i mean you have the freedom of of general coordinate transformations so you can always choose a set of coordinates right uh for instance riemann normal coordinates which in which your local four dimensional metric and also your local spatial metric would be uh would be the either the lorentzian metric or just the cartesian metric okay but in general you don't want to do that right in general you want to work in a in a coordinate independent way so you don't make such an assumption so this this h defines a metric on on uh, this uh spatial manifold and now so what we want to do is we want to define all the geometrical quantities on our spatial manifold so we have a metric we also need to have a derivative operator we need a derivative operator on the spatial manifold okay so the question is how should we construct a derivative operator on the spatial manifold and what is the reason for doing this derivative and all this so and so forth right again because ultimately we want to write down uh we want to take this this uh, einstein hilbert lagrangian right and we want to decompose it into parts which can be written in which you can read off the spatial dependence and the time you know the the normal dependence independently right because if you cannot do that then you can't uh, really write down and you, you can't identify what the lagrangian is so your uh, this ricci scalar right it has components which are come from the geometry of the intrinsic three dimensional surface and also from the extrinsic curvature of that surface so we'll talk about the extrinsic curvature part also and all of that requires a notion of an intrinsic metric and also an intrinsic three dimensional derivative 
So how do we define this three-dimensional derivative? Uh, well, we just use the projection operator. So we say that uh, dA, if you have some an arbitrary field, right? So you have your covariant derivative is, and so you would say something like this. Okay. Now in this, I'm using a sort of a odd combination of indices because I'm using one spatial index and one space space time index. That's just to distinguish the fact that this del, this is your covariant derivative in C plus one dimensions. And this is a spatial covariant derivative. Okay, and then this is the point. Yeah, sorry. Covariant derivative, right? Uh, it is a definition of covariant derivative on uh, sigma t. Yes. Or uh, and, and it it turns out that this is the unique. Uh, uh, it turns out that this is also the unique derivative compatible with the intrinsic metric. Okay. 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 And of course, we are working here with the assumption uh, that uh, this covariant derivative is metric compatible uh, with the full four dimensional metric and also that it is torsion free. Uh, so that torsion free assumption is there in everything. Okay. So, Deepa. yeah. Uh, this might be a naive question, but yeah. we talked, you talked about uh, picking coordinates a while back. Yeah. Is, is not the three plus one decomposition a form of picking a coordinate system because you pick a parameter T and then uh, you're picking uh, a, a tangent with respect yeah. to it? Yeah, sure. You are, I mean, okay. yes, that's exactly what you're doing, right? You're, you're picking a set of coordinates and three of those coordinates are your spatial coordinates. One is your time coordinate. Okay. Yep, thank you. Now, the, uh, we want to be able to define it on this, uh, oh goodness. Um, yeah, Deva Malia. Uh, so your question is, uh, how is it ensured that a connection in 4D is mapped to a connection in 3D in the definition of the spatial covariant uh, uh, derivative? Okay, well, uh, we, will, we will see the answer to all of these questions as we go forward, okay? But I have to just uh, make a small payment and uh, well, it's not a small payment. Construction. Okay, so now we, this is how- uh, Sir, I had one small question now. Hello? Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, sir, actually, uh, actually it is related to Devmalia's question as well. Like, no, just, how is it- Just hold your question. Yeah? Just hold your question for a, for okay. a little bit. Okay, okay, okay. okay. We'll, 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 I'll give you all a chance to ask a question later, okay? So, uh, if this is for a scalar field phi, what if I have an arbitrary tensor, uh, let's say uh, some T mu nu. So what will happen is that again, I take the covariant derivative of this four-dimensional tensor and I put a factor of this projector um, for each like this, uh, sorry, C alpha. Now, 
what happens is right that yeah it's a obvious question which you are which you are asking is that associated with this covariant derivative there will be a christoffel symbol right and that christoffel symbol uh, will be uh, given which it will be the same it will uh, be the christoffel symbol so your question i think is that how is this christoffel symbol related to the um, four dimensional christoffel symbol and uh, well one one will have to look at the algebra for that okay but the fact is that this derivative operator is associated like i said it's the metric compatible derivative operator right so by definition that means and you can you can you can check that fact so i'll leave it as an exercise for you all show that this is equal to zero right just by using the the projection properties and the fact using the fact that um h a b is equal to g a b plus n a n b and that the covariant derivative acting on the metric gives zero all right then and then once we have a covariant derivative then we can define other quantities so for instance uh we have the riemann tensor right now what is the definition of the riemann tensor for for a space time without torsion it is related to the commutator of the covariant derivative right so is given by a b um this i will just give this a lower index this for convenience d v d this is the definition of the riemann tensor okay so we can define the riemann tensor exactly the same way once we have a covariant derivative we can do that right and okay and these indices maybe i should uh, put uh, as a uh, new new alpha beta space time indices new 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 v alpha so this comes in new alpha this is the four dimensional riemann and this is the three dimensional riemann and then our goal is to understand how these these are related to each other okay and now before we can uh, can do that we will need a piece of information that is missing which is so what does this riemann tensor do it measures the intrinsic curvature of your manifold now there is a manifold can have two different kinds of curvature right it can have intrinsic curvature and extrinsic curvature so as an example of intrinsic curvature you imagine that you have some flat surface let's say okay and then you take a segment of this surface okay and you cut it out and then you take the the resulting uh surface and you glue these ends together right so if you do this with a piece of paper right what you will find is that you get a you get a conical singularity at this point you get a deficit angle right so this deficit angle measures the you have created a local uh, this thing excite you know little bit of curvature at a certain point right and of course you can also do the opposite thing which is that uh, instead of uh, removing excising a piece uh, you can 
you know, again, you make a cut and then you take a piece and you insert that cut into that cut, right? And then you, your deficit angle will be positive. So what, these are the two different kinds of curvature that you can have, right? One will be positive curve, curvature and one will be negative curvature. This will be positive curvature, right? And this will give you negative curvature. Right? Now, I, I hope that, that visually you can imagine what this procedure is. So you, you can take any smooth manifold, let's say there are some smooth manifold with, with curvature. You can, you can repeat this procedure in three dimensions, in four dimensions, any number of dimensions, right? So the way you do it is that you, you, uh, you know, if you want to think about uh, the same kind of thing, you first construct a triangulation or a tessellation of your manifold, right? So now what happens in a, in a, in a triangulation is that you have, a, you have these uh, pieces and all of the pieces, they fit together, right? In a tiling, they all have to fit, they have to match at each point. So if you take a piece and you modify that piece, so if you have a hexagon, for instance, you replace it with a pentagon, then what you will do is you will create curvature at, in the vicinity of that pentagon. Or if you take the pentagon and replace it with, with, with a hexagon, you will create, I think you will create curvature. Okay, so that's the discrete analog of continuous curvature. And later on, we will see that when we look at the loop, you know, the, the quantum picture, that actually a similar sort of, it's essentially the same picture, but with uh, quantum, uh, you know, everything comes with quantum, you, you know, have to use operators and so on and so forth. So this is extrinsic curvature, right? And the way an observer would measure extrinsic curvature is that if you move in a, in a, in a, along a geodesic, along a, a closed path, right? What will happen is that uh, your tangent vector will not return to its original position, right? So intrinsic curvature, is measured by the failure of the tangent vector to a closed curve to return to itself after being parallel transported around that curve. So it doesn't have to be a tangent vector, it can be any vector of a vector which is attached to a closed curve. So you have some curve you take a vector, okay? And now you parallel transport this vector, right? And when you parallel transport this vector, right? That vector in general, if you are in a space time, in a space with curvature, that vector will undergo some changes. And when it comes back, it will be rotated with respect to itself. So this tells you that there is curvature in this region which is enclosed by the loop. So this is an intrinsic curvature. Okay. As an example, if you take a flat sheet of paper, right? This flat sheet, well, there is no curvature, right? 
Riemann, Ricci, everything will be zero, right? Now I take this, this, this sheet of paper and I glue two of the ends together to form a cylinder, right? Now you can ask, does the surface of the cylinder have any, curv have any curvature? No, R is still zero. For observers living on the surface of that cylinder, there, nothing has changed. Right? They will they will see the same geodesics. They will see the same same lines. Everything that is a straight line on this flat sheet is mapped to a straight line on this geodesic. But if you are an observer who is standing outside, right, you will suddenly see that well, you know, you will say that well, there is some curvature. I can see that. But the reason you can see that, right, quote unquote, see is because you are looking at the embedding, the embedding of the cylinder in R3. How, how is it embedded, right? So how do you uh, measure this other kind of curvature? This is called extrinsic curvature. This leads to extrinsic curvature. And this is not zero for the cylinder. It's zero for the flat sheet of paper, for the unrolled sheet of paper, but for the cylinder, it's not zero. And how do we measure this? this? Well, you want to, like, like I said, it has something to do with the ambient manifold. Ambient manifold is the manifold in which you have embedded your surface. So how do you define, how do you describe this embedding? Well, at each point on your, in your, of your manifold, you will have some normal vector, right? And this, so this normal vector is pointing uh, this, so if your manifold is, this is your d dimensional manifold, sub-manifold, or let me call it a k-dimensional sub-manifold, right? And you have a d-dimensional ambient uh, manifold. M, right, such that sigma is embedded in M, then N is a normal vector, right? And if sigma is co-dimension one, right, then you have a unique normal vector So that is the that is the situation that we are looking at. Okay. So in this case, how do I define the extrinsic curvature? Well, I'll give you the definition first, and then we'll we'll motivate it a little bit. All right. So the extrinsic curvature. Uh, again, I'll write like this, KAB equal to HA mu, HB mu, del mu, N mu. So this thing is also known as a second fundamental form, by the way. If you look uh, in or the extrinsic curvature tensor. Okay, this is also very nicely explained in Wald, by the way. Uh, in Wald, um, there is in, in chapter 10, uh, they talk about, Wald talks about, let's see what happened in chapter 10.
Yeah. So chapter 10 of world is about the initial formulation of general relativity, initial value formulation. So that means basically the Hamiltonian framework. And uh, let me let me share my screen and show you these, these pictures because Walt has been really nice. Walt is just, I love Walt. <laughs> so, okay, so you can see the this screen, right? So this is the initial, okay, what happened? Why is my screen share? Let me, let me do that again. Okay, so now you can see, right? This is the initial value chapter on the initial formula, value formulation. And this, this is the standard notion. Now, uh, you have this NA. So if this is a unit time like vector field, which is normal to sigma, then it's derivative along a direction tangential to sigma must agree on sigma or that. So you define this, uh, you take the covariant derivative of your normal vector. And this covariant derivative, it uh, becomes equal. So we'll, we'll see what it, what, it, what it gives us, okay? So let me again go back to, ah, yes. Now Nehal is asking, is this true for constant? Nehal, I'll, I'll wait for your uh, <laughs> for your answer. I think Mustafa is uh, responding to you. So this this quantity is called the extrinsic curvature, and um, let's see. It turns out uh, that this extrinsic curvature has a very nice uh, characterization, which relates it to the intrinsic metric okay so how is that so let let us take these uh, these uh, tensors and uh, you know i mean i'll just use greek letters for everything so we have h alpha mu is equal to delta alpha mu n alpha n mu, okay? So we substitute this and let's see what we get. We get delta alpha mu, n alpha n mu, then delta beta nu plus n beta n mu acting on del mu n mu, okay? Now, if you look at this expression, if you look at this term, what this term will give you is n beta n mu contracted with delta mu n mu. All right? Now, this can be written as n beta times delta mu n mu n mu one half. Right? You can convince yourself that this is true. Uh, because right, it's just it's just saying that if you have f f prime, um, that can be written as the derivative of f square by half, right? And now this is a this is just the norm of the vector, and this is minus one, so this quantity is going to be zero. So then we are left with delta alpha mu n alpha n mu times delta beta mu del mu n mu. Okay. Then, um, right. and then this becomes, if you just look at all the deltas and so on, you get delta alpha n beta uh, plus uh, n alpha mu n mu, right? N mu, del mu, n beta. So this is our 
this is the expression we end up for uh, the extrinsic curvature. Okay. Now, uh, this uh, turns out, right? So this is just the covariant derivative of uh, the normal vector. And so this uh, this uh, makes sense, right? I mean, because see, if you, if you think about a flat sheet of paper and you, and you move it like this, you, you put some curvature, then how will that, that curvature be measured? Well, you imagine that there is a normal at each point, right? So if your surface is flat, then your normal, as you go from point to point, the normal will not change. But if your surface becomes curved, what will happen? As you go from one point to another point, right? Your normal vector is changing in the ambient embedding space, right? So the greater the rate of change of your normal vector in the embedding space, the larger the amount of curvature of your embedded manifold. So that's why we get this covariant derivative. Then makes sense. But what about this extra term here? So now this is uh, the nice thing: is that, um, and I'm and I'm let's see, and I have an extra in I think somewhere. Um, uh, no, I think I think this is fine, right? So this quantity, okay. Um, can be written as so let me first write it, then I will tell you what it is. It can be written as this, as something we call the Lie derivative of the tree metric H alpha beta with respect to this vector field N, okay? So what is this LN? This is called the Lie derivative. And what is the Lie derivative, right? Lie derivative, I mean, we have ordinary derivative, covariant derivative, and now we have Lie derivative. So well, what is Lie derivative? Lie derivative, so it basically means that let's say you have some vector field V, and then you corresponding to that vector field, one can generate the integral curves, right? So you just get those integral curves by integrating the defining expression for that vector field, right? So if, if a curve, for instance, is given by, has coordinates x mu, uh, then the vector field uh, is just the derivative of x mu with respect to tau, where tau is some parameter along that curve, right? So if you know what the vector field is, then you can find out what this x mu is by integrating the vector field along the parameter. So that's why these are called the integral curves. And what does, what does a, what do these integral curves do? What do they do? Well, if you look at, if you take a point here on this integral curve and you follow that point up, as, as it moves along this integral curve, right? So what is happening is all the points on this manifold, again, sigma, all the points on this manifold sigma are being mapped to another manifold. Okay, let's call this manifold sigma prime by the action of this vector field, okay? As, as, a, as an example, again, if you, if you think about in, in just two dimensions, let's say I have some curve, okay? This is my sub-manifold. Let me say this is sigma. And then I have a vector field and I'll, I'll pick a very simple vector field. Uh, v mu is equal to, uh, one comma zero, 
okay so uh, what is this this is dx by d tau dy by d tau right so this this basically what will be the integral curves of this vector field they will be straight lines pointing in this direction right these are the integral curves what will these what will happen what are these curves doing so each point on this sub manifold after some delta tau reaches another point here similarly each one point here reaches it here and so on am i audible yes okay yes so i'll i'll call this sigma tau and i'll call this sigma tau plus delta tau so what is this vector field doing it is uh generating uh a diffeomorphism between these two surfaces okay now in this case uh and and that's what uh, our uh, uh normal vector field also does or the time like vector field but the time like vector field has two components right there is a shift component as a normal component the shift component generates spatial diffeomorphisms right so if i have a tangent if i have a vector field which is tangent to a manifold it will only take that manifold into itself i i hope you can visualize this so uh, right because for instance if you look at all of these vectors you can write a component which is uh anyway no, how let me not do that so so what happens is that if you want to describe the uh how a vector field changes how a surface changes due to the effect of that vector field now you have to keep track not only of the uh, so you have to talk about this uh, diffeomorphism how how is this diffeomorphism changing so when you try to define this notion of a, of of a, of a diffeomorphism and again this is very very beautifully explained in an appendix of wald uh which you know i mean i pretty much keep going back to whenever i whenever i i forget what i'm doing is this is that let me write down the definition of a of a lead derivative of an arc arbitrary tensor so i have some arbitrary uh tensor mu1 to mu k and mu1 to mu l these are the indices of that tensor and uh the definition of this lie derivative with respect to the vector field v is written and this way limit t goes to 0 i mean i i don't know how many people here know what a lie derivative is that's why i'm sort of um going over this if everybody knows what a lie derivative is then i guess we don't need to do anything more but let me just finish this this is the definition of a lie derivative what is this map phi and this map is the uh, diffeomorphism which is generated by the vector field so this diffeomorphism it carries not only points from one manifold to another but it takes every other geometric object right for instance if you have a tangent vector here this tangent vector is also carried into another tangent vector on the neighboring manifold and if you have a tensor same thing so that's what this lie derivative does it measures how an arbitrary tensor changes under the effect of a 
vector field okay so now let me just give you some definitions of a vector field what what this vector field does this is the lie derivative for of a for a scalar so if you have a scalar field the this is just the regular derivative ordinary directional derivative right then if you have a vector another vector w or uh, then this is the lie derivative of the vector w with respect to v it becomes the commutator of the two vector fields and in terms of indices the way you would write this is l v w alpha let's say like this and the commutator of vector fields uh, is uh, written as uh, v beta del beta w alpha minus uh, w beta del beta yeah. this is equal to v this is the commutator of two vector fields okay. so this is the lie derivative of, of a vector and what you see is that the first component is the ordinary directional derivative of of the object w with respect to along the vector field v but it's the second term that is different the second term measures the change of the vector field v itself right and uh for uh, one forms it's the same thing but with a positive sign so similarly you can define the lie derivative for an arbitrary tensor in this way for each uh each upper index you get a term of this kind and for each lower index you get one term of this kind so for instance let's say you have a tensor with two with one upper and one lower index what would be the lie derivative of this graph well it would be first just the directional derivative with respect to mu then you would get one term so then this t alpha will come out and then um so let me write it down what is t alpha and then uh beta in u this is the term you get for the upper index and for the lower index you would get uh in beta uh del u u i think i think i'm doing this correctly let me just make sure that i have um minus right so uh, yeah and this has to be um, no wait wait a minute Minus t mu beta del mu v alpha. Okay, now this is the right one. Alpha mu v. What am I doing? Uh, yeah, no, this is fine. Great. and then this is so this is the lie derivative of a, a tensor of a rank 2 tensor and if i have a rank so if i have a you know with both lower indices well let's see i get two terms like this 
I get h alpha mu del beta v mu and then I get one term one term for each index so this is mu and then uh, beta del alpha like this. so this is the lead derivative of a of my rank two tensor now this this term these two terms together it turns out they correspond exactly to the lead derivative of the uh, this free metric with respect to the normal vector field so let us see how that comes about so we have the normal vector field and we are writing down this quantity so this is h alpha beta right and again just repeating these uh, computations del beta and mu and mu uh, beta del alpha and mu. now what you do is for each occurrence of h here you substitute um, and and here also you substitute the expression for h which is g alpha beta plus n alpha and beta right and then what happens is that del mu of h alpha beta becomes del mu of g alpha beta plus del mu of n alpha n beta but this term is zero right so all the derivatives of the four metric they will vanish when there's only one derivative from here and then when in this term in terms of the form h alpha mu uh, del beta n mu what will you get g alpha mu plus n alpha n mu times del beta n mu what will this do this will just lower the mu index so i will get del beta n alpha and what about this this term this term has this n mu del beta n mu and we saw earlier that that is zero right so that term will give us zero so we are just left with del beta n alpha okay so when you collect all these terms what you will be left with is uh, is precisely this this expression i'm not mistaken right there is some mistake i'm making in the indices so you please again <laughs> i leave that for you as an exercise okay exercise evaluate the lead derivative of this h alpha beta and show that it's equal to k alpha beta okay so what is the point of all this uh, we have defined the intrinsic metric which is h ad we have defined the, the covariant derivative so right and we have defined this quantity which is the extrinsic curvature of the three manifold which is kab with these three quantities in hand we can proceed to uh, complete the adm decomposition so for now i'll i'll leave it here uh, but ultimately what will happen is let me let me give you the result so you will have some um, something to look at is that ultimately the four dimensional ricci scalar we will you will see that it can be written as a sum of the um, 
three dimensional Ricci scalar uh, plus this quantity k a b k a b and then minus k square. And this equation is This, this is one of the nicest and also one of the most useful equations in differential geometry. And this is called um, the Gauss Kodatsi equation. Okay. So, what will happen is we will substitute this Gauss Kodachi equation in our Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian. And our Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian is this quantity. So instead of this 4R, we will substitute uh, this expression. And so what, what this expression does is, right, it uh, separates, it writes this four dimensional curvature entirely in terms of tensors which are defined on the three-dimensional manifold. So because this extrinsic curvature is also a purely spatial tensor. So this is another property of the extrinsic curvature is that uh, it is a, well, it's purely spatial. So you have a purely spatial intrinsic field metric and these points. And this is a very nice equation, right? Because it tells you that uh, in a way, you can probe the geometry of a manifold. So like for instance, if I have my three-dimensional space here, I want to probe the geometry of this space. Well, what I can do is I can take a two-dimensional surface, any two-dimensional surface, right? And I can, I immerse it in this, in this three-dimensional space. When I immerse it, then I measure at each point at any point on this two-dimensional surface, I measure the local Ricci scalar, the intrinsic metric of the of the surface, and I measure the these extrinsic curvatures, right? And the point is that this constraint restricts the way in which the manifold can be embedded, right? You, you so that means that if you have some given if if you have some curvature in your embedding space, right? And if you want to say that your embedded manifold also has some extrinsic curvature, then you can only embed this one in the larger manifold in such a way that, for instance, this quantity is fixed. Or conversely, if you want to fix the extrinsic curvature, then that will fix the, uh, that will constrain the intrins possible intrinsic metric. And when we do this, after doing this, then we will be able to define the configuration space of our Lagrangian system. And the configuration space will consist of the three metric HAB. This will be the configuration variable. Okay. And we will find the momentum by the normal procedure. What is the normal procedure? The momentum is um, this, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to H dot, okay? H dot is the time derivative of uh, the three metric. So we'll see what that time derivative is and what uh, this derivative is. And this, uh, this quantity, uh, well, what does it turn out to be? It turns out to be uh, the uh, proportional to this KAB uh, minus K times HAB.
so i have a i have a small doubt uh, or question uh, uh, may i ask yeah yeah now now you can all ask question yeah uh, so in the gauss uh, kodasi equation the k is actually the trace of k b right yes yes yes, yes. So okay k is equal to Uh, now, um, Takato has a question. Does the intrinsic curvature quantify monodromy? Now, actually, Takato, I, I forget what monodromy means. Can you please remind me? Uh, I mean, uh, for example, uh, if there is uh, some field, phi, and if uh, take phi around uh, one point, and so, for example, uh, if uh, if you if uh, one define a uh, field phi on a complex plane, and if you evaluate phi zero and phi exponential two pi i, then if phi two pi exponential two pi i and phi zero is are different, then there is non-trivial monodromy. And is it like is is the intrinsic curvature is so evaluating monodromy in a sense? I mean, I, uh, well, I, I, to be honest, I didn't quite follow your description of what a monodromy is. Uh, shall I uh, get back to you on Zulip? Can you ask this question on Zulip? Okay. Just, just put this in Zulip, and then, uh, like, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a decent answer rather than just some random thing which may not be correct. Okay, and I, I have also another question. Yeah. Uh, so is the intrinsic curvature is like torsion? No, so torsion is, is um, it, it measures another another property of the manifold, right? Uh -huh. so for instance, uh, so the thing is that um, it helps to think about uh, torsion and curvature in, in terms of uh, what do you call it, defects in crystals. Okay, so this is actually a very nice uh, perspective that has been promulgated by uh, this German physicist called Hagen Kleiner. And I think ultimately it has to do with something to do with quantum gravity, which is that if you take a lattice, right? You take a uniform lattice. And so you do this, this same thing that this procedure that I had described uh, earlier uh, of uh, removing and gluing things. So you, you remove one node of the lattice, okay? And then you connect the remaining nodes or you insert an extra node. Then what you will be doing is, right? You will be di distorting the lattice. The lattice will be locally distorted, right? Either it will be like, punched in because of the missing node or it will be stretched out because of the extra node. Mm -hmm. Right? So th that what that does is that creates curvature. Mm -hmm. But now, so that's a certain kind of defect you can have, right? Point, those are point defects. Now you can also have line defects. You can have this, uh, dislocations and disinclin disinclinations. These are two different kinds of defects that you can have in a, in a, in a solid. So uh, this one that I've mentioned, this, this kind of a defect, um, I believe it goes by the, this, so this is a, a disinclination, if I'm not mistaken. And so the, these correspond to the, this uh, Gaussian curvature or the intrinsic curvature. But you can also have uh, disinclinations. Now, what are disinclinations? They measure the shearing of two surfaces. So if you imagine taking two lattice planes, you, you have some lattice, you um, cut the bonds, right? And then you take this half of the lattice and then you twist it down and then you re-glue it again. Okay, in sort of maybe visualize that. So 
that is called a disinclination uh right this dislocation and disinclination i forget which one is which one so but that is the one that corresponds to torsion that generates torsion i see okay. now the thing is that in normal in usual differential geometry the problem is that we only um you know we 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 tend to ignore ignore torsion right but um, but torsion also plays an important role uh in in geometry you can't just you can't just throw it away i mean it's a, it's a it's a degree of freedom right and uh, as they say that in nature nature is not wasteful so uh if there is some something some degree of freedom then nature will use it in some way so one possibility is that for example torsion uh, can be associated maybe with uh, uh, with elementary particles like uh, fermions because what happens is that if you if you have a a fermion if you have a fermionic field then we will see this later when we talk about the connection formulation of gravity that when you insert fermions into your in your space time those fermions they generate an effective torsion so so maybe maybe torsion degrees of freedom can be interpreted as matter as you know so matter would have a geometric uh, origin in that uh, picture ultimately that is the goal of quantum gravity right it's to give a geometric description of everything uh, and that's what our string theory uh, tries to do right i mean when you talk about uh, the kalabi yau manifolds right what is that that's geometry you're just talking about different shapes hmm. so uh, so you you said the gaussian curvature is uh, one of the extrinsic curvature so sorry uh, again i should not use the term gaussian curvature because i think that means something specific uh, so so yeah so intrinsic curvature doesn't measure Uh, so in the presence of torsion you will get other contributions mm -hmm. and i i believe the intrinsic curvature and the extrinsic curvature will the expressions everything will be modified the reason is that these that these commutators right they no longer just have a riemann on the right side you also get a term you also get terms on this side which uh are proportional to the torsion right because what the torsion measures it measures the lack of commutator com of commuting of these derivatives on scalars so the whole question of <coughs> torsion degrees of freedom in in this in this picture uh, i don't think people have really looked at it uh i uh, i don't think anybody has really done justice to torsion in in this uh, loop quantum gravity so so that's uh, you know something that's uh, if if anybody wants to work on it uh, as a research project it's there but it's 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 probably going to be very tedious and you know a lot of lot of algebra and lot of mathematics and so if you're not uh, afraid of long and tedious and lengthy calculations then you know well that's this pretty much everything in in theoretical physics so so i had one question yeah yeah so can you just scroll down a bit uh, in k alpha beta this uh, the curvature part mm, so uh, so you are writing the rikit the rikit answer is yes, after this the last the last equation you wrote uh the gauss could actually okay yes sir the gauss hmm so here uh, this kab uh this is uh, this is a spatial tensor or uh, this this kb is a cur uh, curvature right measure of extrinsic curvature kb is the extrinsic curvature right yeah so this uh, curvature is of space time or just space so this 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 is a so yeah the good question 
this extrinsic curvature, the way we define it, right, in terms of this covariant derivative, right, it's, a, it's the covariant derivative of the uh, normal vector, right? Yes. But then what I, what what you're doing is you're taking these two vectors. Yes. And you are projecting. So what do these do? They take any tensor and uh, you know annihilate the orthogonal the part which is orthogonal to the uh, to the hypersurface, right? Yes. So that means that this KAB becomes a purely spatial tensor. Totally spatial. So, sir, how are we like? Uh, so, uh, there is a four component Ricci tensor, right? No, no. And then, so, yeah. So, that that is the that is the uh, beautiful thing about the whole, whole whole situation, right? Is that is that you can um, you can measure uh, the uh, intrinsic curvature of a higher dimensional manifold using quantities which are defined. Only in terms of 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 a lower dimensional manifold. Okay, okay, I got it. Thank you. But the thing is that right, those quantities depend on the embedding of the lower dimensional manifold. So you can embed the manifold in different ways. Like I said, you can embed a sheet of paper, and in this way, you can make it flat, or you can make it a cylinder. Okay. And also the fact that, uh, right? This is this is the other thing, is the fact that the extrinsic curvature turns out to be equal to this quantity, the Lie derivative of the intrinsic metric in the normal direction. So what what this extrinsic curvature measures? So the intrinsic curvature, the intrinsic this metric. This H A alpha beta. If you if you take the square root of the determinant of this metric, right? It measures the local volume. Yeah. Right. So the extrinsic curvature measures that as you go along the normal. So you have the leaf of your foliation, right? Yes. You go from one, one leaf to another. Leaf. Yes. Let's say the local volume volume element expands. Yes. So then, how will that be described? That will be described by a positive extrinsic curvature of your surface. Right? Okay. Makes sense. Imagine your leaves are circles, concentric circles. Okay. Okay. So if you take a line segment on one circle and then you transport it along the normal vectors, the normal vectors are the radial vectors, right? Right. Then that line segment becomes larger when it goes to the next circle, right? Yes. And it becomes larger. So, uh, and the extrinsic curvature of this uh, circle is positive. Yes. It's positive when measured in this direction. Uh, mm. the Along the norm. Right. So, if you go in the other direction, then yeah, it's negative. But. It's negative. No, thank you. Sir. So, so of course, this. So, this is also another important point. This extrinsic curvature you can define it consistently only if your surface is orientable. If you have a non-orientable surface, right? So, so, orientability means that you have a unique normal at each point. But if you take something like a Mobius strip, for instance, a Mobius strip, um, you you don't have a unique normal because if you take the normal at on one side, you go around the strip, the normal comes back pointing backwards, right? The other direction. So in that case, you have to modify your notion of extrinsic curvature in some way. I don't know how to what that modification is. So here the assumption is that your foliation is an orientable surface. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, sir, I have a question. Simple that uh, Deb Muller speaking. Mm. Mm. Sir, in the Gauss uh, Kodasi equation, can you uh, bring it in? Bring the equation. Mm. Sir, sir uh, uh, in KB KB term, mm. 
is it always positive or it can be negative or this depends on the signature of your space time okay. so how does it signify in physical situations or in physics if is it oh, oh you are asking whether this 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 term you are asking whether it can be positive or negative in general right yes or, or we, well uh, so like i said it so the, the extrinsic curvature measures the local expansion of your of your volume element as you go from one slice to another slice yes sir right so can this can this be positive or negative i mean again i i have to think about that off the cuff i don't know okay 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 all right so i guess uh, we'll stop there and uh, my apologies for all the interruptions um and uh, now my whole house is contaminated i have to wipe down everything and hopefully uh, i have not been contaminated too so our next class will be on friday at 6 pm and we will not have any interruptions and so uh, takato i'll be grateful if you could just ask a question on zoom if about the monodromy thing okay that will give me a uh, you know way to remember yeah i already did okay. all right so all right thanks uh, thank you everybody for coming i'll see you all on friday